What's up, guys and girls? My name is Ray, and I'm here with Dr. David Johnson. Welcome to another episode of the Brains and Gains podcast. This is episode number two, and today is an exciting one. We are talking about Charles Poliquin and the three things we each learned from Charles. So, uh, Mr. David, Mr. Brains, um, who was Charles for, for the audience who doesn't know who Charles was? So, I mean, Charles has been around a long time. Um, obviously, he's passed away now, um, but uh, he was probably the most well-known strength and conditioning coach uh, in the world. Um, and we say strength and conditioning, not just in one field, but in terms of multiple sports. He has had over 20 uh, medals in different sports, including the world and Olympic level. The most recent was in wrestling in the last Olympic Games, uh, gold medal. Helen Morales, right? Helen Morales, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I remember watching that, actually. That was cool. Um, and so uh, with that, he was an educator uh, and a pioneer, really, in terms of bringing strength and conditioning to the forefront, I think, of you know, any yeah. personal training uh, as career. Yeah. Pretty phenomenal. Yeah, even as a even as a, even as a human being, I think he was a phenomenal human being. Very from interesting like, man. From yeah. a very very interesting man. Um, if he liked you, he liked you. Yeah. If he didn't like you, he just he didn't, didn't like, like you, you. and uh, you would be the butt of his jokes. But he also did author of eight books, which we've uh, tried to lay out in front of you. Um, the most popular one, I think, for a lot of the people who are fans of Charles would be The Poliquin Principles. And I think it's where a lot of us started our journey. It's the first book we picked up and we started reading, and that's where the journey began. We're like, And we were just mind-blown, mind-blustered. Um, yeah, yeah. And we're like, whoa, this is really cool. Um, so that was, I think that's, that's Charles in a nutshell, right? Um, unfortunately, he passed away about three years ago. And uh, it left a big, big, big hole in the industry. A huge. A big hole yeah. in the industry. Huge. And uh, yeah, um, so let's dive into it. Three things that we learned from Charles Poliquin. You go first. Me go first. Okay, number one. I think the biggest thing was the reps dictate the weight. And, and that is written in all of his books and all of his training uh, manuals. Yeah. But it's, I don't think people really understand it. Yeah, they don't. I don't get it. They don't. Um, I mean, so, elaborate, please. Yeah. So people look at the percentage system and they go, right, I'm going to take 75% and do, you know, uh, categorically something like 10 repetitions with it in, in the sort of continuum. And, and that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. But the repetition, the number that you put down is the desired result that you want. Yeah. Right. So we know on that continuum, there's zero to 20, for example. And within that, we've got these breakdown that Charles used to call, you know, relative strength, functional hypertrophy, hypertrophy and strength endurance. And that would be on that continuum. Yeah. Um, and then the repetitions would dictate where you want to be on that continuum for the training goal that you wanted. So was yeah. it strength? Was it functional? Was it hyper? Yes. Was it, was it uh, strength endurance? And then, so we took away the percentage system because any given day, it could fluctuate also. Right? Yeah. So there are lots of variables with that. And I think just by using, letting the weight dictate the repetitions allows you to pick that goal very, very precisely. I think my my first point is pretty much very similar to that. Before I started training, before I learned from Charles, it was more like, you know, hey, you know, three sets of 12 reps and that's, you know, what you want to do. Maybe like four, 15 sets of body part, 16 sets of body part, and boom, that's done. Um, but then he, I was introduced to loading parameters, right, which is rep, set, tempo, intensity, and the manipulation of all those to get the desired result that you want, and or how to make things more interesting or make things different for your client. But I see this in the in, in the industry a lot. Is that a lot of coaches have gone away from the meat and potato exercises, yep. and they're trying to find these fancy fancy movements and and uh, reinvent the wheel, uh, reinvent the wheel, um, where, you know what, hey, you put someone under a squat, you know, you say, you know, you got a four zero one zero tempo, um, and you got to do, say, for example, 10 reps, and then you got, like, uh, someone who, uh, who, who nails that for, like, a, a block of training, right, and you go to another block, and you can then program, say, for example, maybe eight reps of a six zero one zero. And that's a different stimulus. That's a different. That's a different um, intensity. But a lot of people have like, oh, that's boring. Like, what the hell am I squatting every day, or what am I? Doing? But you know, it, the squat is the most bang for your buck exercise, and that's where you see your most results. And the basics remain the basics. And that's what I learned from Charles. That's my first point: is that 
Everyone hammer, hammering those basics. If you don't have those basics, how do you expect to, to do program design? Yeah. And it's like learning those fundamentals, I think, is missing yeah. in every other situation. Yeah. What's your number two? Number two. The, it's an interesting one. It was a difference I brought up to light. Actually, it's in his first ever book, and it was talking about fast twitch and slow twitch. Ah. Um, and there's a lot of people, you know, and there's research out there and stuff like that. But when you train enough people, you realize people respond to uh, loads very, very differently, and yep. you have outliers. So you have a normal bell curve in statistics, yep. and the people in the middle are generally respond to most of the training that's out there. Yep. Then you have people on the, either side of this bell curve. Um, and for example, I, I talked in my last podcast about my neighbor who was doing these two, two and a half hour workouts, yep. high volume, you know, stuff like that. I would never, ever, ever, ever grow like that, no yeah. matter what I did. I was just yeah. sore, and I got smaller. Nothing ever worked. And when I did some of the stuff in the middle, you know, I followed everyone else. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I kind of saw some gains, but it wasn't great. It was only when I understood what fast twitch meant, yeah. and I spent a lot of time with Charles, um, understanding this concept and applying it in a very specific way. Um, and that allowed me to basically really understand that there are these individuals, and I can also with muscle groups. So individuals who respond to very low reps for bodybuilding yep. so my 75 percent of maximum which on that continuum we talked about last time for most people is about 10 reps yep. for me it's five five or six yeah. yeah and so that concept blew my mind so i took the same loading percentage if you understand that and i went let me do it under a tempo so strict conditions so 401 and how many reps do i get out i get five yeah so that's my bodybuilding is that five reps yep which blew my mind. I was like, this is why I am not gaining the weight that I want to gain, right? Yeah. And then I saw individuals who are the opposite end of the scale where they could do 70% for like 35, 40 reps. And they're massive and they blow up yeah. when they do that. It's just using that glycogen, yeah. boom, yeah, boom, yeah, boom, yeah. boom, in that particular time frame. Yeah. Yeah. But I've seen guys who can bench press, for example, in, in a fast twitch manner but have very slow twitch biceps, which I find is interesting. So you can test the two muscles. My biceps don't grow no matter what I do because they're following the same principle. And then you test the biceps with that. And you go, right, your biceps need 15 reps, your chest needs five. And then you play it like that. And then they start seeing results. So I thought that was the coolest thing for a long time, particularly on my journey, to find out what worked and what didn't work for me. I'm intrigued. So um, for the audience who doesn't know what fast twitch and slow twitch are, can yeah. you give a little bit more? Well, uh, I mean, there are tons of muscle fibers, but this, this kind of stuff you learn in basics is fast sort of intermediate fibers and slow twitch fibers. The fast twitch fibers are sort of white, um, used up within you know one to 10 seconds. Um, and then you move into the more intermediate fibers where they kind of use a bit of both and they last a bit longer. And then the slow twitch oxidative fibers where you kind of go into the sort of the endurance aspect, a lot of blood, and they can use a lot of different fuels. So you, you go along in that continuum. So what you're looking at is very fast and fatigable. The middle range is kind of in between, and then the, the very slow, sort of less fatigable fibers. And so those that use the fast twitch fibers kind of get in and out very quickly, and then those that turn into endurance are the opposite end of the spectrum. So you have the spectrum of fast and powerful, slow and continuous. Right. Uh, there's a caveat there that we all have all of those fibers in us, yeah. right? And different muscles in different people will have different amounts of those different fibers in them, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And some people, this is the point, some people have more of the slow uh, twitch fibers in, in say like the bicep, then somebody else will have more of the fast twitch fibers. Yeah. So it's that whole thing of individualization. And that to me was the, the coolest thing. Could we do an episode with how, like, what would be the best way to, like a, a more practical way to test what kind of fibers you have? Do you have any ideas? Yeah, I mean, the testing protocols and more, I mean, Fred Hatfield written about it as well. Apart from it's, taking a biopsy. Apart from taking a biopsy, yeah, <laughs> which you don't, don't do that at home, folks. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just literally applied in the gym. It's testing all your one rep max and then doing taking a percentage and, and under strict conditions. And again, it's strict conditions. So what, what there are two things there is that if you really want to be something, you will push and try to be something or foul earlier to be something that you're not. So mm -hmm. if you really want to be fast twitch because you think I'm going to be the strength athlete and you know what those percentages are, you know how many reps you're meant to get, people tend to foul the test and try, you know, pretend they're, they're fast twitch. So it's really a good thing not to know, if you can, the sort of percentages yeah. uh, and how many reps you should Go be. Go with the blank slate. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's a great way to test people. If you want to know yourself, that data is out there and information is out there. I don't know if you want to put a link in there somewhere. Um, but it's a great way to kind of see what, you know, what, what, what am I in? And there's yeah. a whole thing around that. How do I train then? And that's the big question. Yeah, nice. So what about you? Number two, what was yours?
Uh, number two for me was the relationship between carbs and um, fat sites on your body. Right? Um, fat deposits in various places in your body due to varying hormonal um, changes or reasons and, or uh, conditions. Um, so that was something that I, I picked up from Biosignature when right. we, did the, we did the course. I mean, everyone, you know, I was never a master. I'm not going to say I'm a master, but I, I, I took what applied to me because I wanted to get better, right? I wanted to, I remember when we were in the Biosignature course and, you know, he made me stand up and, you know, um, he thought I was Samoan. There you go. And then when I said I was Indian, he said, Sit <laughs> you're just fat. <laughs> um, so... Um, I think the, you know, Charles is very direct that way. And, um, but the idea was uh, like the relationship between carbs and fat on my body, for example, like when, uh, in biosignature, there are certain sites that you measure with like calipers, right? Yep. So, um, the ones that I am more, um, intrigued by is subscapular and superiliac, which are basically more the insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance and glucose and, yep. um, so I'm when I remember when we did the the test on my subscap. I think it was uh, Benoit who did it for me, okay. and I think we were sitting at about thirty three. Uh, okay, so that was uh, quite a large measurement. A quite a large measurement, right? And then um, Charles was talking about protocols with like you know training and carbs and how you like, you have a cup of rice before and, uh, or like after or whatever it is to to. And I put up my hand. I was like. Mm. I was like, how much should I eat? And he's like, what's your measurement? I was like, 33. He's like, you get three licks of f***ing prune, buddy. <laughs> so I think that that kind of like went, <laughs> that, 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 that really, you know, made me dive into the whole biosignature, understanding um, carbs. And when I started manipulating and started going from like, okay, you know, and that was the time I was reading John Kiefer. John Kiefer's car backloading. Okay. So I that that's like, yeah. You know, so John Kiefer's backloading was like, and it was wonderful, right? Because you can eat a pizza yeah, every yeah, night. Yeah, yeah. You can eat a pizza every night and you can eat like a cake or yeah. you can, you, like, you can smash yourself with it. Yeah. And I was getting fatter and fatter, right? Not knowing like these programs are <laughs> built for like proper like strength athletes yeah. and like, or NFL players. And yeah. I think that was the, it was NFL players more that, you know, when they were lifting and when they were training because they're, um, and, uh, you know, so it was, it was totally opposite, right. Of what I was learning from John Kiefer's like car backloading. And, um, and, and then when I started like adjusting it, so I went more to like the keto or the paleo and, and, and started to stick to that. You can start seeing the subscap measurements going down and I could see, start seeing the fat go from here and the fat go from the back and you can see the definition back again. And um, I think that was the biggest thing that I took from Charles. And I still preach it today to a lot of the people who want to get into fat loss or who are looking, or who are overweight. Of course, you have the basics, which is like make sure you're sleeping and you're eating clean food and you're, you have your omega-3s and you have your minerals and your vitamins and stuff like that before you start diving into like caliper measurements. But that's something that I've always urged people to do. I was like, you know what? Hey, just why don't you take yourself off processed Carbs. Yeah, everybody has their own glucose response to different foods, right? Correct. And you know that now with the constant uh, glucose monitoring. And so what you see with the rice is not only the amount, but not only the the rice itself, but also the amount that you give at any one time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but you're right. As a as a as a baseline, is come off all you know lower your your carb basically intake. Yeah. And I think that worked for me. That's what I took away, and I started applying it to my clients, and everyone started to see better and better results mm -hmm. because they just started to make more mm -hmm. conscious choices. Yeah. And like, well, if you're getting your carbs, because obviously you need carbs to a certain degree, if you're going to be lifting heavy and if you're going to uh, bust it out of the gym, but, um, and, and then you have work and everything, but the, the, the conscious choices, so I started making conscious choices. My clients started making conscious choices and my friends started making it. And, um, yeah, lo and behold, like we start seeing the, 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 the love handles, uh, come down and you see like the fat in the back and, you know, it's um, a lot of people notice it when they drink, right? So it's like they go out drinking, and then all of a sudden you have these like little. You look like a melted candle, right? And yeah. um, so you put a new one on for that, right? Was the gut inflammation? You call it the Australian side, so you call it this thing at the back. Yeah. So you, they, I, I see that go up with uh, with uh, alcohol consumption. Not one or two drinks, but when you've, you've had a, a night or a skinful, that people tend to come for about a week with that raised. Yeah. 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 So biosignature got an additional or the bioprint. Be, yeah, so BioSig used to be two days long. Right? Yeah, two days long, right? So my first one I did was two days long. Yeah, me too. Um, and that was a very, very long time ago. I think I've done BioSig in the church six times. 
level one, level two, I did twice, and then I did buy a print once. Yeah, so I've been through it a few times, trying to understand and how to apply it in different ways. But the concept is great, and, and I think it's a great it's a great way for for trainers, you know. Yeah. And in functional medicine, it's got an application too. Although with medicine, it has to be you know going to be more careful. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's only as a you know should I be restricting carbs or you know. Yeah. What am I looking at here? It's a good, it's, I mean, even as a self-assessment tool, right? To Mm -hmm. like, just, you know, try to dabble in different things to say, okay, fine. Like what's working for me? What's Mm -hmm. not? And with the process of elimination, right? That's, that's one of the cool things about like, even with biosig, it's like, you know, you know, so so, okay, fine. I I, I think we're diving into biosignature a little bit too much, but um, the grand scheme of things, like um, that was one thing that really, really helped me. And um, confidence levels, energy levels, how I feel, how I look. I mean, as a coach, as a trainer, as someone who was like a, a little bit of an authority in the strength and fitness world, it was it was important that I started looking the part and not just being like a strong a- who could lift heavy weights, but also look like a melted candle when I took my shirt off, right? Um, a melted candle, that's a new one. A melted that's candle, new, that's a very old one. Is it? It's a really old one. And you know the same whole thing with like Paul Check. like if you want to teach nutrition, you better be able to teach it with your shirt off. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, yeah, I think, I mean, we can dissect here and, and, and talk about nutrition and nutritionists and yeah, sports nutritionists. Yeah. That's my second point. I love to talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's go on to So number three, I'll give you my number three. Number three for me, and I think the most overlooked, and I don't hear anybody talking about this, is called rate of change. Rate of change. Yes. Yeah. And Evolution is, of man. <laughs> <laughs> it is a principle I live by. It is one I have delved into and one I use on all of my personal uh, clients, it is basically learning that individual's response to an exercise yeah. or a program and how quick do they adapt to that um, and how quick do you need to change it in order to, to continue making progress. Now, why is that important? So if you have somebody, you know, when you talk about Charles, we talked about the six times, six exposures to a given workout, then you adapt it from there. That was his, one of his rules, you know, it takes roughly six times of a particular, so you're doing a bench press in a particular way, you do it six times, in that way over that, that training uh, block and then you, you must change it. Now people obviously vary from that and that to me is the rate of change. So we've got a 14 inch grip bench press flat, no pauses, 4010, very standard bench press. How quick do you take to adapt to that? So you ha- I have clients that adapt to it every four workouts. Yep. So one, two, and three, there is gain. Number four, you can it just starts to not do so well and then they're stopped. Number five, they actually go backwards. Yeah. Right? And then I've got people like myself, I have to change the exercise every single time I train, which is ridiculous, every single time. So I could do 12 sets of one of three reps, and if I was to train the same exercise next time, I wouldn't get anything out and get too, it'd be useless. So, but if I change the exercise to a fat grips, yeah. I can do 12 sets. Beautiful. And so that individual individualization is important in terms of ter- time. So if we think about if I actually made people do six programs, which in his uh, Charles Poliquin scenario is a 30 day program, yep. it's done every five days, so you get 18 workouts. Yep. So if you think about that and you do the math, nobody sits and does the math. There's 18 workouts in a given month, 30 days. If, for example, uh, four of those workouts for the bench press were, were optimal and they were gaining, and then two were rubbish, you've wasted basically 10 days. Yeah. 10 days of training. 10 days over a year is a very long time. Correct. Right. Now, if you've got an Olympic athlete, you've just denied them a world record or a plant, a a chance on a podium. He said world record for those who didn't hear him. Ah, I believe it. Yeah. Right. I really do. If you've worked with people at that caliber, you tend to realize the smallest changes, the smallest changes, because they are so highly drilled into what they do anyway. Sometimes it is the smallest things. And then very rarely, in fact, I have never had anyone come to me. Apart from somebody Charles that sent me who was training himself, I have not had anybody else come to me and have that in their program design. That know the know what I mean by rate of change, know when they adapt to a given exercise. And so for me that is fundamentally one of the first things I look for. So we do a fiber type testing type mm-hmm. stuff, we do all your structural balance, which we can talk about. We go through all that sort of progress. Yep. All in line with your goals, yep. of course. And I want to know your rate of change because that allows me to get as many workouts in of high quality in a given frame. That's interesting. I think it's pretty cool. Because we, we, I think from back in the day, I would inevitably do it like every four like weeks, nah. say for example. Mm-hmm. But but it wouldn't be as exactly, right? Yeah. So it's like everyone has their different... I think, I, I think I, you know, this doesn't feel good. I'm going to change it today. 
Yeah. Right? So is that you just feeling like crap? Is that because you haven't ate, you haven't slept? Is it just a crap exercise, a gym, whatever it is? Yeah. Or actually, do I adapt to this given exercise every four times? I mean, this is something brilliant um, because now I'm thinking about myself, right? When I'm when when you when you say that there's something brilliant as to like I'm good with like five weeks of the same, I can still go and I can still see progress every 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 time I'm, I'm training. I'm getting, he- like getting right. better and better at it. Um, but then of course there's a point of time where you have to change it, and we do. But um, when I you know back in the day, you mentioned something like this, and I'm like, okay, what? The- I doing when I was a when I was a PT like and we would change it every four weeks right um we would just have a block like okay fine you have like a two and a half you know like two and a half times by a chromium grip like bench four zero one zero and um then after those four weeks you would go into like a little bit of an ultra wide grip or you would go into a change the tempo or you would you know um but as a as a as a standard, we would do like four weeks. I think that came with like the company's guidelines as well. But, but interesting in the personal training world, it comes to every thirty days when people renew their packages. Exactly. You know, so you're coming up to that. So the, you know, if you wanted to sell more packages, then just before they are about to, but uh, you, you're about to ask them for yeah. more money, change the program. Change the program. I say this is really cool. We're going this phase now. Yeah. Oh, next time. By the way, you know, get yeah. thirty days subscriptions up. And so they go, oh, this is cool, and it's easier to yeah. do the deal, right? So I see a lot, a lot of that put in, but that doesn't mean that is. Some, so when people train with me, it's for a longer period of time. Yeah. They sign in, they do whatever, and with that, you know. It is my responsibility to find those kind of things out. Correct. It's not a sales technique. Correct. But but you're right. I think most people just stuck to the, the four weeks. Basically. Yeah. And I think we were too. And, and But I also believe that it's it's person to person, right? Like I say, for example, at Good Life, when I was working for them, we would have people who never trained in their life. Yeah. Right. And it's like. It's very different. You take eight weeks to like actually learn a movement you've done. Yeah. You know, it's like, so you don't take those things into consideration. Yeah. And I think this is important for coaches out there who are trying to train new clients. It's like it, you know, um, what David says does apply, but that applies to like someone who knows what the yeah. hell they're doing. Much higher level. And uh, at a much higher level. Right. And, but that's what I see in this day and age. It's like every workout is different with like the, the coaches like, oh, today we're going to do this exercise and we're going to do this program. Mm-hmm. And, and but the client hasn't even adapted to, to what you did last week. Exactly. Right? And there is a certain level of progression. And, but the client is like super happy because they're like, oh my God, my coach makes me do different things every day. <laughs> you know? So it's like, and, and, but it takes that <laughs> consistency and there is progress and there's, um, and then you get to a point where, yeah, you understand your body. You understand what you need to change when you need to change it. And that only comes with experience and time and having an experienced coach as well. Um, who, who can, who can think at that level? Yeah, I guess. Um, Which one my third, third thing. Yeah, come on. So my third thing, last and final was, um, even coaches need a coach. Yeah. You know, it's something that, um, it was very popular in, in Toronto, in Canada, where it was. Um, and there were a lot of the, like we had level two, level three, level four, level fives, and like, and then level six, which was like the, the high level, right? Um, so we had a lot of the level twos training with me, huh? Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> what did you just do? There's six levels. So like, was it, was this... Anyways, now there's seven. Of course. Uh, now there's seven, right? But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and we did have a lot of like the kids training, you know, with higher level coaches. But it was something that really stuck with me when um, Charles Poliquin started training with John Meadows. You know, when you look up to the, Charles as like the best that I knew and probably one of the best in the world as well, arguably, right? But, um, and then you see someone like that training with someone like John Meadows, who was mm-hmm. like um, a different breed in himself. Of course, a really smart, smart guy. Right. right? Yeah. Like, and, and then you see, you know, um, Charles training with someone else and you're like, whoa, the world's best is training with someone else. Like, what the f- am I doing? You know? And um, I think that changed my life and I was like, okay, fine. Even though I'm, you know, one of the senior most coaches here, I need to start, I need to start training with someone else who I can learn from, who can hold me accountable, who can, you know, program my programs and I don't have a day to skip, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's when I met Mike Demeter and obviously I knew Mike from a long time, but um, I think he was one of those people who even was close to Charles and um, someone who I could trust um, higher level than myself as well and had done obviously all the courses that I have done and obviously written and you know um, is one of the most respected in Canada so when I started training with him 
Uh, it was a whole different ball game. So accountability, variations, understanding real like um, real life programming, and and how it you know affects you and how your mental state uh, mental state affects your training. Because back in the day, it was like, yeah, you were a manager, you were a teacher, you're an educator, you would like train whenever you want. You know, there was no consistent time. There was just like, okay, whenever I get an hour, I'm gonna just train here, <laughs> and you would just write it in your calendar. But then that really taught me. Um, consistency and you know your body does see better results when it's training at a consistent time so um, I think that was one of the big things that I took away from Charles as well I think that it was uh, towards uh, 2016 I think he trained with him 2016 2017 and that was one of the 2015 2016 but that was one of the big 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 things that I took away and I barely see that over here right. I think you barely see it in the industry um, yeah. the smart ones you know I see a lot more in bodybuilding circles, even at coaches, because those guys realize they need somebody else looking at them. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm talking about the people that compete, yeah. um, which again, I think takes your, your business to a new level. Um, but yeah, you don't really see it in yeah. general. You really don't see it. And I think that's something we all should, should take home is that you, if you're not sure, then you need to hire somebody. Like you would hire your, you know, somebody to do your finances or somebody yeah. come pay in the house or whatever it is you do. We all, a lot of people assume that this is you know, very, very simple. Um, and in one aspect it is and in one aspect it really isn't over time so if you want to be good at something you hire somebody to help you make it better yeah so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to upset you I'm going to add a fourth as I do so one of the biggest things again for me was this if you want to gain mass quickly was the intense I mean to use a word here but the he calls them accumulation blocks and he mm -hmm. does basically two weeks for example or so of high volume work five days a week with two days off. So basically you take two weeks of accumulation. Accumulation means high volume versus, versus high intensity. Now you can use the same blocking in intensity so to gain strength, but you'd take two weeks and you would do a lot of work twice a day, yeah. five days, two days off, and then you can repeat that block. For that, for example, um, two years ago in November, I wanted to gain a lot of mass quickly. I gained nine kilos in two weeks. And I'm a natural guy. You know? Jesus. Yeah. Um, and my lifts went up to, you know, very significantly. And all I did for, for basically two weeks was um, was train. So I trained in the morning and I trained in the late afternoon and I did that. And I was sort of trying to add weight to the bar for two, three weeks. And I find it very, very effective. So if you've got the time or the inclination, because it takes a lot, yeah. it's an incredibly effective way to boost anything you want to do. So that to me was, you always think you have to follow a certain program for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. And Charles always used to say, you know, I have 12 weeks or 11 weeks with an athlete. How do I get the job done very quickly? Yeah. And how do, I, how do I do it, you know, making sure that we get everything out of that 11, 12 weeks. And this is one of his ways. Uh, and so um, if you're into it, I would Google it, super, super accumulation. That was what it was called. Um, and I found, I found that incredibly effective. Now I remember super, super accumulation. It was something that they did at Rhode Island too, right? I think where those mm -hmm. hypertrophy boot camps. I, I did one of his camps, but we did all, every day was different methods. So you'd learn different methods. So like the Milos methods of, you know, yeah, insane yeah. giant sets. I yeah. mean, giant was a giant set, right? For glucose utilization, yeah, yeah, for example. Yeah. Um, you know, we did triceps or drop sets or whatever it is that you learn something every day mm -hmm. and then you apply it. I think, again, that was one of his best things. You go to a seminar, you do a bit of theory and like you do in most places, and you go, okay, now you're right in the gym. You know what? And just put it to the test. And that was the only way that you would know what it felt like. Yeah. And I think, again, a lot of people prescribe things. They don't know what it feels like. You know what? This just reminds me. It's like, I am yet to see, um, I see a couple of coaches, but I'm yet to see, you know, that feeling that we got after a Charles Poliquin, like set or a program, yep. which you, it was under supervision, right? Um, the feeling that, and we're, I wouldn't say we're beginner athletes. I wouldn't, you know, I would say we're a little bit higher than intermediate athletes, right? We've been lifting for a long time. We've yep. lifted some reasonably heavy weights. Yep. Um, and but the feeling that we got after that, like we were <laughs> dead, we were finished, <laughs> couldn't walk. Right? You don't see that in this day and age with a lot of the trainers and a lot of the coaches, right? It's it's um, and the uh, I actually see the flip side is like you're you're having a full blown conversation with your client when they're training or when they're leg pressing or when they're squatting on and and that's what really like in like I'm really intrigued by that. Is that how are you going to achieve results if you're not going to push your body to adapt to a new stimulus or adapt to something new or like actually push? It's not. It's it's not country specific. This is no. like worldwide. Worldwide. Yeah. This is worldwide. Every right? gym. Um, every gym you go there, and it's like it's more of a it's more of a chit chat, and it's a this person signed up and they want to get results, right? 
Since he annoyed me, I'm going to annoy him. <laughs> Go on in. I love that. Um, importance of uh, grip training and using fat grips. Grip training? Yeah. So um, I remember, I think there was a time, when, so Charles was a big advocate of fat grips. Yeah. Right. And um, the, the, what I loved about it was the practical, you know, application of it, right? When in life are you actually pushing something that's actually this thin? Right? I was like, this thin, which is a bar right now. Right. or pulling something that's this thin. Um, generally, you're grabbing something or you're pulling something. There, it's generally you need to use you need to use pretty much your entire yeah. um, you know, your, your palm or your hand. And um, starting to work with fat grips was something that really. I mean, if you know, back in the day, I was known for something. It was the pull-ups. And um, yes, for pull-ups, you do need like biceps and back and blah 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 blah. blah but you also need phenomenal grip strength. Yeah. Phenomenal grip strength yeah. because it all depends on that. So inevitably, I didn't know, but you know the whole fat grips, and I had all the different like I think there was the the red and the the orange one, uh, the blue and the orange one at that time. Yeah, right. Those are the more popular ones. So I had those, and I would train with them. Like did fucking crazy stuff, right? You would take the orange ones to the thicker ones, and you would do reverse like thumbless grip um, curls, and just you know mess around with things. You would do like snatch grip, like deadlift with like the orange fat grips and like it was just the craziest stuff that I would always do and then lo and behold like you know you see it you know it, it translates into the different movements you do yeah and your grip just becomes super and your forearm just becomes massive yeah um that was one of those things that really I took from I took from Charles as well so I mean if you do want to get stronger if you don't want to get stronger like practically in the gym or like just in life like you know very very from just the barbell all the time or those machines that have the same kind of like diameter of um uh, the handle and, and you know play around with fat grips um, it was super popular back in the day right and you know it's like now it, the guy one of the guys two guys I think that, that invented it and one of them is a very very good friend of mine um, I remember the day he gave me the, the pair and I remember what's his name let's put a plug in there uh, well we plug fat grips for sure yeah. um, and I have I have them in my home gym I have yeah. all three versions and again they are a variety so I'll bench press one week flat with plain bar 35 mils roughly the bar size yep yeah. Then I'll go to the next blue ones, and next time I'll use the pink ones, and yeah. I'll go back and, and cycle through them. Um, and all of my pull-up station, which is behind us, uh, we'll call all the fat grips on it. Um, and I'm a massive advocate of all sort yeah. of grip training, for sure. Yeah. Um, and particularly in things like what I do, combat sports or judo or jiu-jitsu, it's very, very important. Yeah. Um, but I remember the guy came to me, and he, we went to a restaurant, and we're talking, he goes, oh, I got you a gift. And I'd been looking at these things because there has been nothing to that point in the world that was really cool and exciting that wasn't you know a couple of thousand dollars. <laughs> that you could just put in your gym bag that was a new cool thing you know you had the ab blasts or the straps or there was nothing out there which Rush. actually makes a difference yeah, yeah. it's huge yeah. right and he said here you go he's this. I was like a kid in the candy shop I was like these are amazing and, you know, I was like well, how did you get them he said well, I'll come up with the idea what do you think and I, was, I remember going wow like this is phenomenal yeah this is, you gotta do this man this was phenomenal absolutely yeah. phenomenal and again uh, I went into Arizona I went to a private strength and conditioning facility and the first thing I saw on the accessory place there Fat grips, fat grips. So any good strength coach or anybody who knows their worth yep. needs a pair of fat grips for sure. Yeah, but like I don't see many coaches using it. No, it's absent, pretty much absent. Yeah, and it should, it should be just standard. It should be staple. Yeah, yeah it yeah. should be standard. Um, yeah, that's my fourth. Your fourth. There you go. You got a fifth. <laughs> <laughs> don't tempt me. Um, so let's recap. Okay. Right. Really quickly. Number one. What was your first? Yeah, reps dictate the load. Uh, my number one was manipulate your loading parameters, which are reps, sets, tempo, and intensity. And rest period. I did say reps, sets, tempo, and rest. Yes. Rest, not Jesus. intensity. Rest. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I rest. Uh, second. <laughs> <laughs> second. Fast, slow twitch uh, testing of each individual. My second one was fat sites on your body and carbs. And uh, if you want... Uh, just Google biosignature bioprint, and um, I'll, I'll put a I'll put a link uh, in the description below, and uh, you can find out a lot more about it and start you know dabbling into it and start learning about these things. So they're pretty cool, and if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us. I think we'll have an episode which uh, we actually talk about bioprint and biosignature, and um, from my little elementary standards to um, Doctor David Johnson's. Um, uh, intellect um what what he thinks and 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 his uh, views on it and and you know explaining the ins and outs of it what's your third rate of change 
rate of change. Rate of change. So individualized rate of change, how you adapt to a given exercise or program. Yeah. My third was uh, even a coach needs a coach. Absolutely. Yeah. Number four was super accumulation methods. So yeah. how to get big or strong in a very short period of time. I'm pretty sure if you Googled it too, you would yeah, find it. There's something out there. Like, I think T Nation might. I think there's yeah, an article there is in T Nation. Article, yeah. yeah, there is an article in T yeah. Nation on super accumulation. My fourth was grip training and um, get your hands on a pair of fat grips. I think the last time I checked, you can find them on Noon. Um, they yeah, are available, available on right. Noon. Uh, com. If you're in the UAE or in the Middle East, they are available on. Yeah, they are available on noon. Um, so yeah, that's it from us for today. Uh, three or four things that we learned from Charles. Um, now, guys, if you like the episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And uh, please support us. Uh, this episode is sponsored by Generation Strong. We are both wearing one of our new drops that we have. Um, which is the Thunder Skulls, and uh, this is, these are coming up, coming out in about a week, I think. Um, so support us uh, if you like what we do, and then you can also find a lot of lifting gear, um, fitness apparel, streetwear, all that kind of cool stuff on the website, um, www.generationstrong.com. And uh, yeah, hope you love the stuff there. Hope you love this episode, and make sure you stay strong and stay hungry. Peace.